Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Habitat Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Van Hees, and this is the podcast for becoming better habitat managers. Now, I want to thank the listeners for tuning in once again this week. Another great episode for you. We have Aaron Blysey. Aaron is a deer hunter. He is a um, videographer for the Kiefer Brothers. He's a podcast host and creator, and he's just another habitat manager like the rest of us. And we're going to talk to him today about small properties. Aaron does work on a one-acre piece of timber. Yeah, one acre, guys. That really got my attention when I was listening to his podcast and hear him talk about it. So we dive into all the things that he's done from the beginning to the end on this one acre property, including a couple deer hunting stories and how well that has worked out for him so far. So be sure to pay attention as we get into trail cameras and scouting. We talk about removing the canopy, some food plots, how to access and stay out of a small property like that. It's just a really fun episode talking to another guy who's who's just like the rest of us. Next, I want to thank our sponsors. We have the Packer Max line of Colta Packers. I know these things are flying off the shelves right now with guys putting in their spring food plots. Uh, Brian put his to the test the last couple weekends, planting his killer food plots out there on his property. And uh, he fills us with water, as do I, and that does give it a very heavy weight and you can empty it when you're done throw it back in your vehicle and, and bring it home very easily unlike most other culta packers you can also fill it with sand and avoid the water which makes it a little more heavier um, but still not as convenient as the water so really a great product from lincoln and if you mention the habitat podcast you will get 50 dollars off the packer of your choice next i want to talk about nick nation at the habitat hook Nick has been a sponsor for us for a while, a good friend of mine, and just he has a great product. Um, One of our listeners, Will Stevens out of Louisiana, he bought a Habitat hook, and he's using it to make a funnel. Not just hinge cutting and opening the canopy, but to funnel deer through a small area right by his tree stand. Nick, or I'm sorry, uh, Will says, in Louisiana, hinge cutting doesn't make the top of the list of Habitat projects. But the Habitat Hook is also a great tool for making funnels. So Will is combining the making of funnels with some other tools to make his deer hunting better this fall. Now if you mention the Habitat Podcast when you call Nick Nation at Nation's Creations for the Hook, you will get 10% off the hook of your choice. And lastly, we are doing a giveaway. For anyone who goes on our Facebook and Instagram and shares this podcast post... This is going to be episode number 47 with Aaron Blysey. Whoever shares this post and tags three of their friends will be entered into a giveaway for some killer food plot seed. We are giving away a bag of Climatize. This is for extreme heat and cold. Let me read off what's in the combination here. We have KFP brand peas, KFP brand forage soybeans, buckwheat seed, and KFP brand radish combination. So guys, this is a great combination of seed, year-round, highly attractive uh, protein for the deer that we're going to plant. I would plant in spring, summer, or early fall, and this will plant up to a quarter acre. So guys, be sure to go on our Instagram or Facebook, share the number 47 episode with Aaron Blysey of the Fall Podcast, and tag three of your friends. We will give away this bag of seed to one of our lucky listeners. Thanks again so much for tuning in, everybody, and let's get Aaron Blysey on the line. All right, everybody, we're back with another episode of the Habitat Podcast. We have Brian, my co-host on the line, and Aaron Blysey from the Fall Podcast on with us. How you doing, Aaron? Good. How are you guys? I'm doing well, sir. Doing, doing great. Well. Thanks. Good deal. How's your guys' weather? Well, how about you, Brian? <laughs> Uh, we're getting those storms, I think, that you had yesterday or the day before, Jared. They're, they're hitting us pretty hard. I know Ohio got tore up. Uh, I'm hoping my cabin and my barn are okay when I get up there this weekend. Oh, yeah. I know uh, there's some wind that moved through western Ohio, maybe even a tornado, I think. Um, we yeah. were We were just getting more of uh, some on and off storms up here. Um, 
a lot of rain like usual <laughs> but today yeah. was today was fairly nice how about you Aaron? it's yeah it's so wet up here i mean i'm in the central part of michigan the lower peninsula and i think my rain gauge i think for over the last you know since last wednesday or thursday i think i had just over two inches of rain so it's like it's so wet farmers can't get in the fields right now the wheat is starting to come on pretty good but uh i mean nobody can get in to even just plant corn or beans so it's I feel bad for the farmers and, you know, it's, it's good for food plots, spring plots, if you got them at RDN, you know, so, um, but yeah, it's pretty wet up here. Yeah. I uh, am one of those guys who doesn't have any in yet, just a lot of trees and, and grasses and things like that. Brian, you should be uh, getting a good soak right off the bat here. The ones that you have in so far. Yeah. The chicory and the border patrol are loving it. Very nice. Very nice. Well, Aaron, I wanted to get you on here. I've been listening to your podcast for a while. Um, you got to support us Michigan folks, got to support each other. So, and I've been uh, hearing you mention, you know, how you get into this habitat management stuff. Um, you work on a one acre property, which caught my attention right away. Um, and you're just a, you know, regular old deer hunter, deer hunting fool like the rest of us. So I figured it'd be great to get you on here and, do a little BS session. Um, let's start it out, man. Tell us about you, uh, where you're from, your occupation, um, what part of the state you're in, etc. if you don't mind. Yeah, for sure, man. Um, yeah, my name is Aaron Blasey. I have ran the fall podcast. I started it just right, right now. It's been a year. So a year ago, I've, I've been doing that. And uh, my daily duties, I work at uh, a company called Rusted Rooster Media in I've been doing that for the last seven years and basically my day to day is, you know, right now in this time in the summer, spring, summer, and leading into the fall, I edit and produce outdoor television shows that are on Sportsman and Outdoor Channel. And, you know, in the fall, I'm out filming and hunting, you know, from basically, basically September till January 1st and, you know, sprinkled in January, a couple hunts here and there. But, and then once we get back in the, you know, the winter months, it's back to the grind behind the computer and, and producing and editing and stuff like that. So that's kind of my daily deal. And, you know, last couple of years, I've taken on a new role with, with uh, Chris and Casey Kiefer. I, that's why they're my bosses. I work with them every day and, and uh, they wanted me to do some of their farm management on their properties. You know, we got a big lease in Kansas and we got a couple in Ohio. And, and so I've been kind of taking over that role as well. And just trying to maintain the properties I have here in Michigan to hunt myself too. So, it's uh, every day, 365 days a year, I think about deer and what I need to be doing, whether it's on their leases or mine or what deer is making it through or what I'm going to do. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of me in a nutshell. And I basically live and breathe deer when I'm not, uh, you know, obviously doing family things and, and hanging out with them. So, yeah, that's basically me. Oh, that's awesome, man. And so, I mean, We'll we'll get along just fine then, us three. There's there's no problem there. Um, yeah. Brian and I have that same passion, addiction, what my wife might might call a problem. But yeah, that's uh that's awesome, man. How'd you get into that role with uh with the Kiefer boys? I met them a few years back at ATA, it seemed like great great guys. I know they're Michigan guys as well. Um how'd you start working for them or did you study that stuff in college or, or how did it all come together? Yeah. So first of all, Chris and Casey are, I mean, top notch guys. They literally, I can't like say enough good things about them and what they've done for me over the last seven years. I mean, they're not only bosses, but they're really good friends of mine. So I get to, I get the privilege to be able to work beside them every day and not only be on like a, you know, a, kind of like a employee side of things, but like a, you know, a good friend. So that's pretty cool as well. But, you know, back um, when I was in high school, I, I took, I took a liking to video and like editing. And I really liked that. And we had a, my football coach was our video productions teacher. And I started taking on that and doing some projects there. And I just loved hunting, you know, so that's kind of where it started in a way. Um, I went to college and went to Ferris State University. They have a really good program for television and digital media productions and uh, spent my time there. 
got my degree and in, in my senior year I was going to take an internship and I was going to either go with Chris and Casey they were on my radar or uh, bone collector and then buck commander so I was I wanted to do one of the three and it just so happened Chris and Casey were in my backyard literally I mean right here in Midland so you know they were within a half hour and and I uh, sent all my work to them and my demo reel and everything and they uh, said you want to come in for an internship and said heck yeah so I started and I was supposed to be there for six months and they hired me after two months and I've been there ever since so that's uh <laughs> that's kind of how I got started and you know seven years later here I am you know doing doing things producing their shows and and just having a lot of fun doing it oh that's awesome man what a cool story that's uh that's how it's supposed to work I think um I mean you know <laughs> yeah. you, you go study what you want to do yeah <laughs> You aim high for the big three or whatever you want to call it, and you get a job with one of them. I mean, I think that's exactly how it's supposed to go. <laughs> well, I'm not going to lie. I, I get I get shit from my friends all the time saying, you know, you've got the best job in the world and, and everything. And it did kind of fall in my lap. I won't lie to you. But, I mean, I do have an unbelievable job. I, I said there's a couple jobs that would probably be a lot cooler than mine, and one would be, you know, obviously playing Major League Baseball because I'm a huge baseball fan, so – I think that would be kind of kind of key, but I mean, it's like one percent of people get to do that. So I think I'm going to take this route and and uh, save my body too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's pretty awesome. My I have a buddy who plays Major League Baseball, and he, like you, I know, it seems all great, but you guys work your butts off, man. I mean, you're on the road. Both you and him are on the road a ton. So I mean that you know yeah. it may seem all great, but that that wears on you, I'm sure, away from the the family and home and everything like yeah. that. So I know there's a sacrifice for for those things there. So for sure, man. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Okay, so getting into hunting and habitat management, you uh, you're taking on some new roles with these guys, managing some of their farms and leases with them for them. How did you? get into hunting and start managing for, for better deer habitat or wildlife habitat? Like where did it all start? So, I mean, ever since I was little, I mean, four and five years old, I, you know, I, I remember my dad, he's just been my mentor and he got me into all this and, and I'm glad he did, you know, and, and because it is my favorite thing to do, you know, in life, if there was no such thing as hunting, I, I don't, I really don't know what I would be doing, honestly. <laughs> Um, but, playing baseball. Ex- well, I would hope so. Yeah, <laughs> and I'd be at the latter part of my career now. I'm, you know, I'm 32, so exactly, I'd be probably getting pushed out of the majors. But anyway, yeah, he got me into it, and I just, you know, I I really hunted a lot when I was, you know, in junior high, high school. But I, I also did play three sports, so that kind of consumed my life. And then once I got into college, I played a little college baseball, and then once that kind of started petering out that's when I really started taking more of a liking, like it really like hunting kind of took over for baseball for me. It was like, you know, I'm not going to be able to play baseball for the rest of my life. So hunting is something that I really enjoy and I can do that. So, you know, I kind of took over there and then, you know, honestly, the habitat side of things, I, it's been something that's always, I've always looked at and, you know, read things and everything, but it was something that, I never really got into it. It's something I wanted to do, but the farm that I grew up on. So uh, my great uncle owns the, my family farm and it's 215 acres. Well, he is a logger, so they don't hunt it, but they use the timber on it. So honestly, we weren't really able to cut, you know, any trees unless it was for like shooting lanes or, you know, stuff like that. We really couldn't go in and hinge cut. And I found out that the hard way too, because I went in there one day and just started cutting and I got my ass reamed after they, <laughs> they walked up on and found all this timber, all these new popple growth and everything. And I'm like, well, I better not do that, you know? So it kind of took a backseat, but I always did food plots. Food plots were always something that I did, you know, growing up seeing everybody on TV, like Lee and Tiffany, seeing these lush clover plots and like, oh, I need one of those to kill, you know, bucks. And I'm here to tell you that is so far from the truth. That's, it's not even funny. So I learned that the hard way as well when you're sitting on a food plot and it grows really well, but there's no deer in front of you because they watched you walk into your stand. So I had, you know, a lot of growing pains and I'm not, 
I'm going to sit here and tell you, like, I'm not an expert at any of this. You know, this is all trial and error. And I'm really starting to think that I'm kind of honing in on what works for me. And in 2014, my wife's brother bought uh, an 80 acres and he bought a, a 40. So, and it's divided up by a half mile dirt road. So there's 120 acres, but it is all farmland. And there's one acre of timber on the 80 acres that's in the northeast corner of it. There's just one acre and it's a, it's a triangle. And, um, and then on the other 40, there's like a three acre patch of timber. And so this country and, and, and Jared, you said you went to CMU. So this is, you know, in the Mount Pleasant area. So you kind of yep. know the terrain around here and the farm country, there's wooded fence rows and, you know, little spots of woods, like, you know, maybe 20 acres might be your biggest one. Oh you know, yeah. And they're kind of, Square wood they're kind of, yeah. Yep. And they're kind of spread out. So, you know, in 2014, uh, that's kind of where it started with the, I call it the one acre, but it's actually 120 acres um, with a couple of wooded fence rows. And the neighbors have some some timber as well. But um, what helps is the, the hunter density in that square mile is not a lot. There's not a lot of hunters in it. And I think that's kind of how I've been able to the last couple of years get deer to a three-year-old or a four-year-old, and that helps. But um yeah, I mean, that's kind of how I got into, you know, starting, I've always started doing the food plots, but, and then getting into this one acre, I can kind of break it down if you want to start there, but, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the lead into the habitat stuff, and honestly, habitat, and what you guys know is, has been the growing fad, if you, if you will, you know, it's like within the last couple of years, habitat is what everybody wants to do, and, and, you know, it's fun to do as well. Yeah, no, we uh, we definitely are are growing into it more and more, and we um, you know, with the, with the baiting being illegal in Michigan now, I mean, we didn't bait very much up at school in Mount Pleasant area. There's so much ag that it never really did anything, but a lot of people now uh have to rely on doing something else, like food plots or some timber sand improvement or you know some early successional habitat, whatever it may be. So yeah, you're right. It is a a larger subject of discussion now than it has been. So I can see why why you you you, you see it that way now. So you're saying this is a 120 acre area, but there's one acre of timber, kind of in what one of the corners you said, right? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So the northeast corner, there's one acre of timber on the 80, at the section of the 80. Yep. Okay. So why don't we do this? Why don't we get into you describing the one acre for us, because that's what I've heard you talk about on your podcast, is how you're you're doing the same sort of stuff we talk about, and you keep saying one acre, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, you know, one acre, <laughs> that's that will be the smallest property we covered yet. So I, I mean, at least people understand that it's a part of a bigger area, but really, whether it's five acres or ten acres, I mean, it's all part of a bigger block of land usually. So, I mean, it still kind of has some of the same principles here. You're still focusing on improving the habitat in one specific spot, whether it's one, five, three, forty, exactly. So, why don't you go ahead and tell us about the one acre, you know, from a maybe a mile high view. What are we looking at? What's around it? And um, why you decided to start there? Yeah, so... The one acre is a, is a it's an eighty acres that runs north and south. So it's got a few rolling hills to it, and there's two um, there's two waterway ditches that come off of the west road that kind of work through it. So there is a little bit of topography change. Now the north fence line is there's a few trees in it, not a lot. I mean, maybe six trees that are spaced out, and there is a, another eighty acres to the north of of the one acre so that is only beans or wheat every year they that farmer does not do corn so it's only beans or wheat um across the road is corn it's been corn the last two years um and then the rotation on the one acre side that that farm ground right now is is wheat right now and it's the south that south 40 of it's going to be beans so I'm, I'm kind of worried this year because of the food um, situation. I don't have a lot of it, but I did go and do some frosting within the one acre 
and I did some resurrection clover from killer food plots and I'm not going to lie, man, it is coming up like crazy and I'll get into that <laughs> in a little bit. But, um, so yeah. And then on the East side of the one acre, the neighbors, they have a hundred acres that run East and West and it's kind of a skinny hundred and there's warm season grasses that butts up to the one acre timber. And then it's got like an olive ditch with water in it that comes off of the, it'd be the South point. So where the fence row hits my timber, that's a wood, my, my East fence row is all wooded. So that helps out. Um, the biggest, biggest downfall of this one acre is it's off of the road, at least, you know, 200 yards. So my access is very difficult, very, very difficult. Like, the deer see you coming from a mile away and it's hard to hunt. And I'm really starting to, you know, figure that out now. And that, that's my next step is trying to figure out how to hunt it. And I got a plan in place this year that I really want to see if it works. But, uh, so he bought this land in 2000 and well, this would be coming, would have come into the fourth year of it right here. So 2015, or, or yeah, I think it would be 2015. I think he bought it. That was the first year on the farm. In this one acre of timber, it's got a, it's got a water source. It's a little creek, and it you, it's probably four feet in diameter. But it's always got water in it all year. It does not matter because it's the runoff from the ag fields. It's I've never seen it dry. There's at least a little water in it all year. Okay, nice. And and yeah, so that helps out. And it runs from if you can picture it, it runs from the northwest corner basically all the way to the southeast corner so it runs the whole length of the one acre well when i first got this i was like awesome excited to have more ground to hunt but it's not a lot so my wife and i hunted it um a little bit that year we i only hung one stand on it and i had a rifle blind on it um for for gun season for her and she bow hunted it a couple years we had some good bucks on there what i mean by good bucks is we had probably Two bucks that would be right at, you know, Pope and Young that were three years old. And all the other ones were you know, two and a half. And it was corn that first right. year. But the the timber, you could see right through it. I mean, obviously, one acre is not very big, but you could see right through it. I mean, there was no – it was all leaves on the ground. There was no, you know, new successional growth. It, there was – the canopy was up 40, 50 feet. There was no food in there. And honestly, that first year, I never – saw a deer in that timber not one time oh wow so yeah so coming into that winter after that season uh my wife's cousin cole bechtel he's been really big into hinge cutting and habitat longer than i have so i kind of started picking his brain and that's when i discovered jake illinger and jeff sturgis and jake illinger has been a very big help of mine and is a super awesome guy and really knows his stuff when it comes to hinge cutting and habitat improvement. And, uh, but that, that winter Cole and I went in there and decided to, my, my whole plan that winter was to try to, I was going to go on each side of that, that Creek and I was going to cut, we were going to hinge cut along that whole thing on both sides to, to try to have more access coming in. So to, Basically, it was going to be for a blocker. It wasn't going to be for bedding. It was just block, so I could get into a stand, or we could get in a stand. Because I knew it was going to be beans the next year, and it was going to be hard to get into any stand. Went in that next year, and we did a little bit of hinge cutting, and I don't know if it worked much. My wife ended up having an encounter with 130-inch deer uh, in rifle season, and the gun wouldn't go off on her at 40 yards. And it would have been oh, her biggest no. lock in. I'm in Missouri with Casey, and she's calling me. She's in the blind. She's like, this deer's on front me, and the gun won't go off. And I'm freaking out. <laughs> and I'm like, why does this have to happen when I'm gone, you know? Uh -huh. But uh, so that, it kind of helped a little bit there. And uh, coming into, which would have been that, the second season had been that winter that's when I really started to get serious. Cole and I really started trying to get a game plan. And that's when I called Jake and I said, Jake, do you have any pointers or, you know, he's like, how about this? You know, I'll come up there and we'll do a day's worth of work. If, if you want to do some film and everything and, and we'll do a, a trade off. And I'm like, that's, I mean, great. If you want to come up here, he came nice. up here for one day. Yeah. And he, 
I mean, in, in about five hours, I learned so much. I didn't have enough paper and enough ink to write down everything that he was telling me. <laughs> and honestly, the biggest thing, our, our number one goal was to get everything to the canopy and or get the canopy down for, you know, more food and try to get more grass growing up on the fourth floor because there was nothing. And, um, I mean, we went through there and cut and cut and cut and thickened it up. I mean, it turned this one acre into like five acres, if that kind of makes sense. I mean, really, a deer, yeah, I mean, you can't see through it anymore. Even when, you know, there's no leaves on, like it is just thick and I've cut trails through it. And, you know, coming into, uh, coming into that, right to that hinge cut year when we did all that, I, that's kind of when the, everybody started hunting the buck beds kind of thing and looking for buck beds and yeah. the bed hunting was big yeah. and in faults and stuff like that. And I went through there and I found what I figured was like two different buck beds on one acre. So I was pretty excited about that. Really? And yeah. And you know, everything I read up to this point, I should go back a little bit. Everything I read to this point was like, you need a canopy over these deer when you're creating beds and creating buck beds like they need to feel secure and so i was like okay you know everybody was telling me that and so when we went and did the hinge cutting that's kind of what we did i mean on the north end of it we made a buck bed and on the south end we made like a doe family group you know on, on the points and i hung up three stands and one haker for different winds and was like well we'll see what happens and what ended up happening was in the middle of this one acre, it just so happened that when we cut everything, it left an opening, like probably 10 foot by 10 foot, not very big at all. And there was no canopy over it. It was wide open to the sky. And, but it was thicker than hair in a dog's back around it. Okay. And there was like trails going. It was the hub. It was basically the hub of a wheel. And I had trails right. going every which way around here. And my whole plan was to make trails everywhere in here to, for any exit for these deer. I wanted them to feel as safe as they can and as they could leave or, you know, do whatever they can. But I just did not want a buck to be able to, to just walk the edge and see him. I wanted him to, I wanted to make him have to come through this hub and hopefully I was there. So when I was cutting trails, I would only go five to eight yards and then I'd make the trail turn and then go another five eight yards and make the trail turn and keep doing that. So it was like a zigzag pattern because I wanted him to make him have to weasel his way through here to, like I said, so. So you're talking about cutting trails zigzag through the already hinge cut and and felled tree area, right? Yeah. Yep. And that was, that was the plan. Um, And in my head, it was a great theory. Like, let's do this because, you know, I, like I said before deer could see through it and they wouldn't have, you wouldn't, make them go through there so i wanted them to go through there so this hub uh there was a tree that we cut off the hinge broke and it wasn't a good hinge so it's it's tall as tall as me it's probably five foot ten inches and it's right in the middle and it's right on the edge of this hub so i'm like one of the big things that jake was telling me was when you're doing these small acres he's like you really have to think differently you literally have to stay out of here until you have every right scenario in your favor. Like you cannot come in here at all, at all until you come to hunt it. And I'm like, that was hard. That was a hard pill to swallow for me because I love cam. I love trail cams. I like getting pictures of deer, you know, and I just like (laughs) seeing the fruits of your labor. You know what I mean? I like going back and checking things out, you know, and, I told myself, I said, August 1st, I have to be out of here, done with everything. Like, that was my drop-dead date um, until until the right wind, until the right, you know, whatever, right scenario, I have to be out. I had all my stands set. Um, Aaron, I want to I touch on a couple points there yeah. um, that you mentioned. And, and, like, checking trail cams, as I'm sure you know, maybe in other places, like, Illinois or, or Kansas, I think you can get away with a little bit more than you can in in more of a pressured state. And correct me sure. if I'm wrong, but I think like 
I think guys out there, I think you maybe can get away with checking it every day during your hunt, during the rut, or maybe once a week or once every two weeks. And it's totally, I'm not speaking totally in general, but, um, you know, certain situations allow you to check it if you're smarter about it. And I'm with you though. I can't, I can't check mine as often as I'd like. I feel like I do more damage than I do in good, you know? For sure, man. And I see it on a day-to-day basis. I'm sorry, Brian, go ahead. No, I was just saying that was a good point. So go ahead and, and finish your thought, and then I got a couple of questions for you. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree with you guys anymore because, like I said, I see it on a day-to-day basis. We're hunting Kansas and Ohio and, you know, Missouri, Iowa. And honestly, I it's just – I think it comes down to the pressure. You know, all deer don't like the smell of humans and all that stuff. If, if you keep your scent control in check, it's it, you're going to be fine. I mean, I've seen – when we were out in Kansas, we'd go in midday and check a camera and then leave and come back and sit in that stand that was right over that camera and have, you know, a booner walk underneath of us. I mean, 100% and walk right by the camera and not have right. in daylight hours, you know, and Michigan, I mean, I'm taking this approach from now on, on all my farms or any ground that I hunt in Michigan. And you just got to stay out of there. And I'm not saying don't use the cameras, but, I took a totally different approach to cameras last year when I was coming into last year. After all the hinge cutting and everything, what I did is I put a camera on in the one acre. That's what I was going to say. I put it in the one acre looking at that hub. And I said, I'm literally not touching this unless I come in here and hunt. Because my whole thought on that camera was, I want to see what happens for next year. I want to yeah. see if deer moving through. All I want to see is if deer were moving through here and what they right. were doing what times of day they're moving through there and what, if they're bucks or, or, or what it is. And, uh, the other cameras I put on like a single tree out in the middle of a fence row, the only tree by itself. And I put a, a licking branch right there. And I said, this is straight inventory. I was not hunting anywhere near it. it you, you look at this tree. I mean, I could show you this tree and you'd be like, there's no deer that are going to come by this tree. And I swear to you, I had every buck and I said, I don't care if it's at night or if it's, you know, in the daylight. I do not care what time of day it is. I just want to know if these deer are here and what's here. And, man, it worked. It worked to a T. And um, I, I can kind of stop there so we can get some more questions. But we can kind of stop there. But that that is kind of my approach going forward now is is getting inventory. And then my cameras I'm using for the following year for, you know, any historical data if anybody believes in that which i kind of do sure absolutely yeah i just wanted to back up a little bit aaron this um one acre uh, a lot of people can relate to that i think a lot of our listeners ears are perking up while we're talking about this i just wanted to back up and uh, you know get a little more details on was this more of a uh, just an opportunity that came along and you thought you'd go check it out or is this something that you've saw and thought boy i bet you i could do something with this because it's the only cover in all this open farm ground what was your thought process when you came came upon this well so i have some friends that hunt in this you know relatively the same area you know the same topography the same farm ground and consistently they're killing you know good good deer every year and what it's good. I mean, they're killing deer like 160, 150, 160 inch deer on three acres of timber. And I'm like, how, like, what's, how's this work? I mean, it's mostly happening in the rut. So it's like kind of luck of the draw. Like you got to be there when a buck's cruising, you know, it's just, you got to be, you got to kind of take a chance. I mean, all these woodlots are usually out in the middle of sections. So you look like a, like a turd walking across the field trying to get in here, you know, and it's like, you're hoping like oh, you're yeah. not blowing anything out of that timber. <laughs> and, and it's just the chance you're, well, it's the chance you got to take, you know? And I, I kind of saw that. And then when my brother-in-law bought this ground, I looked at this and I'm like, you know what, this is like, this is a challenge for me. I'm going to try to take on this new challenge and see if I can make something of it, you know? And, um, it's kind of how I started my podcast in a way because I was scouring the internet for small acres. And when I mean small acres, I was looking for five or less acres 
to see what other guys were doing in pressured states to improve their habitat. And I'm not kidding you. I couldn't find one thing. I couldn't find a video. Right. I couldn't find a, you know, a, a article or written anything. I couldn't find a guy like all of us, you know, every day, every, you know, blue collar working guys that are doing something. And I needed some like insight and my brother, or my, wife's cousin Cole, he's, you know, he helped me out a ton. And, um, you know, so that was kind of what stemmed my podcast in a way is because the thought in my head was like, I want to get these guys on here that, you know, not a lot of people have heard of. They're doing extraordinary things. And, you know, a Greg Lipsinger out in, you know, New Jersey could have a scenario that, you know, you, Brian, have in Ohio that might be a, a – same type of timber or same type of bedding area or something. And you're like, all I want is that one person to listen to the podcast and be like, man, light bulb. I have that same scenario Greg did and he entered this way. Sure. And, you know, that was my whole thing behind my podcast as well. And, and that's how it kind of started, but it was, it was more of a challenge. You know, I wanted to see, I wanted to see if I could, you know, get on deer that were three and a half years and older consistently and you know, I what everybody wants to 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 kill a buck every year. You you do. I mean, and I would be lying to you if I said I wouldn't be excited if I didn't. But my success right. has kind of changed over the last couple of years having this ground. It's went from okay, I want to try to figure out how to get bucks to be here, hold the does. I want to try to figure out how to hold the does and make some food because I can't put any food plots on on the property. So what's that challenge? And then I want to figure out how to hunt it. And then I want to try to figure out how to consistently have three and a half year old bucks cruise this in daylight hours. And I mean, I'm not kidding. The last, last year was unbelievable, unbelievable. And in, in what happened. So before yeah, we that's a great point. go ahead, Brian, keep going. No, I was just going to say, that's a great point because uh, a lot of people think that you have to have so much ground and, I think like you said, Aaron, starting your podcast, there is some information that's starting to get out there. Um, guys are starting to realize that, you know, first of all, a lot of us can't afford big properties. And even no. even the 40-acre blocks that were more reasonable 10, 20 years ago are, are starting to get out of the range of a lot of blue-collar people. So I've got friends that are looking at 10 acres, 5 acres, picking them up and doing amazing things with them. So that, I think that's, that's really good to draw attention to that because unfortunately hunting, hunting's getting a bad rap that it's becoming a rich man's sport. And, and, and in a way that's happening, but we can also stop making excuses and feeling sorry for ourselves and look at opportunities like you did instead of saying, Oh crap, it's one acres. I'm not even going to waste my time. You're saying, Hey, challenge accepted. Let's do it. And, and look what you're doing with it. Yeah. And I, I couldn't agree with you more on that because if you drove by this one acre, you'd be like, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't look at it and it wouldn't be like a, a globe around being like, that's the one acre you need. You know what I mean? It's not like that. And I just wanted to, I kind of wanted to document it throughout my podcast as well. And I'm not going to lie. Probably my listeners are probably getting like <laughs> losing the podcast because I mentioned it so much, but I'm just trying to get the awareness out there of literally, like you said, it does not matter how much ground you have, as long as you have the right piece, like, yeah. and you can make it into a, a good piece, you know, behind my house right here, my neighbor owns 20 acres and he's not really a hunter. He, he gun hunts. And man, I tell my wife every day, like how much I would love to buy this piece because it's like, it's perfect ground to mold. Like it's in a good state to be able to make it the way I would want to make it. And it might take me eight, 10 years to kill a good buck on it, but you know what? That's, what's fun for me. The process is actually more fun for me than, you know, the end goal. And like I said, that's kind of what changes that's changed my success. What I think is success over the last couple of years. Well, and to further expound on both of you guys' points, I think, uh, Brian, you nailed it on the head as well. Um, as, as you did as well, Aaron, like you start out with one or maybe five or 10 or, or 15 and then you learn, like we're all doing this to learn. Like I'm learning what to do. I'm learning what not to do every time I'm out there. Like I'm learning not to plant 
300 miscanthus rhizomes with a shovel and a drill. I will never do that again. <laughs> so, but like, I know that now and like, I wouldn't have known that if I wasn't out there trying it or doing it. Like you can listen to this stuff. You can read about it, watch videos, whatever until you get out there and do it. Like it's the whole learning experience. So maybe someday if I'm lucky enough and like Brian said, work hard enough and set my goals high enough, I can maybe buy a bigger farm like, Brian, you didn't start out on 40. You had a 25-acre farm before that. You worked your way into it, too. Like, you know, everybody right. you can work your way into it. So starting small is definitely not a bad thing. And like you said, Aaron, I mean, we all kill nice deer on, on these small properties. So it can be done. It's not going to happen all the time, you know, two bucks a season or whatever. But, like, just get out there and keep compounding your, your growth and your you know, your profit from each farm and roll that into a bigger one. And I mean, you just keep, you can keep going and going. So you, you starting the challenge with your one acre, me with my 15, Brian with your 25 and now your 40. I mean, the next piece, whatever that is, we're all going to know what not to do. And right. we're all going to know what really worked. So it's kind of yeah. like, it doesn't hurt to get out there and start. For sure. And, you know, to kind of go back as well and to your, Brian, to your question about, you know, why did you want to get into the project of the one acre? Well, honestly, you know, which, which you guys know, Michigan's always been a bait state and it isn't anymore. And, you know, my deer camp with my dad and uh, uncles and, you know, their friends, like I grew up a bait hunter, you know, that's what we did. And you hunt, sure. you sit, you know, you hunt one stand over the whole course of the year and you wait for a deer to come to you. And I feel like in some way I felt like my, uh, woodsmanship kind of like plateaued at an early, early age in a way. Cause I was, I was relying on bait, you know, I was relying on the deer coming to me. And honestly, the last three years of doing this, you know, trial and error and kind of throwing myself to the fire. I've learned so much in the last three years of how to do things and how to implement different tactics and okay, maybe I better not do that again, you know? And, you know, just kind of take a step back and be more, be more of a patient hunter in a way and going in at the right time and, and doing the things I should and staying the heck out of there. I mean, I can't, I can't express that enough and just resist the temptation and <laughs> take up basket weaving if you have to in the summer, just so you keep yourself busy because <laughs> just so you don't go out there. <laughs> I'm telling you. Well, Aaron, nice, nice job bringing it right back to where we left off, buddy. You were talking how you stay out from, what, come August 1st, is that right? Yeah, August 1st is my last day um, to even set foot on that property. And August my brother and September obviously, out, wow, okay, so two months out, okay. Yeah, so I, I, I'll kind of come into this last deer season because this is when everything really started um, working out. And so on, on, the, on the one acre, 80 acre, it's an 80 acre on that piece, so – on the it would be the southwest corner of it there is an old farmstead it's got a house on it well it doesn't have a house anymore we we tore it down my wife and actually and i are going to build there in the next couple of years um and it's got uh it's got three barns on there and, and my brother-in-law holds you know some of his implements and tractors there and everything well it's the highest point of the whole property is where this you know where the barns are so i can pull up there and i can glass the whole 120 acres from there and I can see everything. So that was going to be my biggest thing going into this year. I was going to stay way back and there was beans all around me. It was all beans. So I'm like, I'm just going to, you know, just try to film all these deer. And I wanted to know where these deer were bedding. And I found out where they were bedding and it wasn't on me. And this was all summer like velvet and it was on the neighbors and I don't want to give up too much information, but it was on the neighbors. I found out where they were betting and it kind of, it made a lot of sense to me. It, they were betting um, around a water source and mm -hmm. it's in the middle of a section where it's that particular piece is not a lot of people can get to it. And it made a ton of sense. And I, one night I saw nine different bucks walk out of that. And literally it's the, what I mean by water source, it might be, a quarter of an acre, like a little wow. bottle, basically. Yeah. And it, it made a lot of sense. And I watched their summer pattern and they weren't coming on me a lot. And 
So I just filmed all these deer and there was a deer. So back when, when, when my brother-in-law bought the farm, there was a deer, he was two and a half at the time. He only grew one side with a spike on one side and he was a two year old. He was there all year and uh, with some other bucks and coming into being a three year old, which would have been not last year with the year before he was still there and he was a ghost. I got a couple of velvet pictures of him, but he, he got a little bigger, but same thing one good side and then one spike and then uh this year i didn't know if he was still alive or not and he showed back up and he was a tank he was four and a half and uh, i ended up calling him jim abbott because of many baseball fans jim abbott was a big pitcher out there in the majors and he he was born only with one good hand and uh, i kind of took a spin off baseball there and nice so i named him jim abbott and like I said, as a three-year-old, he was a ghost, and I watched him all summer in the beans and filmed him, and along with some other really decent deer, really good deer. And um, so that was my plan, just stay back, not go on the farm. Literally, I was going to drive up the driveway of the, the homestead or the, you know, in glass, and then I was going to pull back out, and that was it. And it worked because the one acre, that camera was running all year and I didn't go into the one acre. So my last time in there was like, like I said, like August 1st, I didn't go into the one acre until November, um, November, oh boy, like the 10th, 11th, something like that. Nice job. So I wanted to go in so bad in early October. Yeah, that was so bad. Tough, I bet. Jeez. Because, and I don't know if you guys remember or not, um, we got a really good cold front in October this year. It was October 10th through like the 14th. We had a couple and, of them, but that one was the yeah. first really good one. Yep. Yep. And the only thing that kept me out of the one acre in that cold front was the wind was never right. Okay. It was never right. So the only stand I had for that wind was across the road on the 40 acres. And that's got a three acre patch of woods. And I had a stand on a field edge and, it was uh, um, it was November or it was October thirteenth, I believe it was, and I so I have to walk through an ag field to get to this stand, and you know you're growing up and you always learn all these things and read all these things like you know don't go through fields in the mornings you're gonna kick a lot of deer out, and I'm like well maybe just maybe me going in really early under the cover of darkness maybe I can get into that stand and have, you know, hopefully something will come by me. And I got in the stand early and I could only hunt until, uh, I want to say it was eight o'clock. Uh, that, that doesn't sound right. It was like, I think it was eight. It was, I only had like an hour and 15 minutes to hunt that morning. And, and, and refresh and real quick, which stand and which date just to be sure. So this is this is in Michigan. It's on across the road from the one acre. So okay. the it's it's in the three, three acre. acre patch on Got the it. forty acres. Yep. And that was so I could, what date? October thirteenth. Okay. okay. Sorry. Was. Go ahead. Yep. So I went in there and just slithered my way through the beans as slow as I could. I got to the timber. I didn't have to go through the timber. I was going to go on the edge, and there was a deer. I kicked up a deer and ran into the into the timber that I was gonna hunt on the edge of blowing and blowing and i'm like oh my gosh just stop but every time i figured it was a doe every time she'd blow i would just keep walking you know just like hurry up in your stand and just maybe something will happen the daylight got the daylight came and cracked and uh she blew again blew again and i'm like seriously like you can't smell me you can't see me like what do you do you know <laughs> uh, so I'm sitting there and it, I hadn't seen a deer. No, I saw a little buck um, come out of the neighbors and kind of work over to my bean field. It's, an, it's a bean field that I'm on inside corner. And I kind of look up about 600 yards away and I'm like, man, that's a big deer. And uh, in a different patch of timber and I picked the vinyls up and it was Jim Abbott. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's the first time that I've seen him on the hoof in a stand. And, uh, I'm like, wow, it's like, he's big. Like I could tell his body size was just ginormous and his neck was so big. I've never seen a deer nice. in Michigan with, with a neck that big in October, you know? So he started working the, the edge of the timber, kind of coming my way. He had a long way to come. 
and I lost sight of them. And usually what happens is when deer get into this section of timber on the neighbors, I know exactly where they're going to pop out. So I'm like, just maybe he'll pop out there. And when he pops out, he'll be at 100 yards. So I'm sitting in there, and I'm texting my buddies and my wife, and I'm like, I've got to get out of the stand here in literally like 15 minutes. <laughs> and I have to. Like, it's the I got to. And uh, also I look up, and he pops out at 100 yards, and I'm like, oh, boy. Like, please. I'm the only extra I'm, – I'm the sitting in – I'm sitting on the edge of the only timber to get him from that section to the next section. So I'm like, just please come cruise this timber, please. And he walks to the fence row and he walks right up the fence row to me on a string. And I shot him at uh, 18 yards. No way. And yeah. (laughs) Well, it was good until I released. (laughs) And, uh, it happened fast. Um, I didn't cut a lot of lanes in this tree because, like I said, I was sitting like a turd in a punch bowl out there because I'm on the edge of the timber and not a lot of foliage. So it was like a do or die kind of thing. I hit him high, and I could tell I hit him high in the shoulder. And he ran out in the field 80 yards, started licking himself. My arrow came out, and I watched him walk off the field the same way he came. And when he got in the timber, I'm just like freaking out. I'm like, what just happened? You know? And uh, I got down and took the long way out. And I actually had to go to a funeral that morning for my best friend. His mom had passed away. And so I went to the funeral and we did the funeral stuff all day. I never even looked at my arrow or nothing. And um, I waited uh, all day until basically last light that night and went and got my arrow. I had eight inches of penetration. The broad had broke off in him, and I tracked him for four hours that night and found very little uh-huh. blood. Found very little blood. My plan was to, you know, get a search party ready for tomorrow, the next day, search. Searched all that day. Um, and two wood lots over, I found blood. And where I lost blood, where I found blood, it was literally like a needle in a sec. It was 600 yards from where I lost blood to where I found blood. I was just looking at the leaves, and my dad was there, and I'm like, wow, here's blood. Nice job. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, I brought my dog with me and another dog just so maybe they'd get a scent maybe, and and maybe he'd be dead. But he was running towards the only standing corn in the section. Mm. And this Mm. this standing corn is huge. This field is over 100 acres at least. And uh, kicked him up in the corn, and six days later, he showed back up on camera, and he was fine. And, wow. um, yep. And then, so I hunted him the rest of the year, make a super long story, a little shorter, hunted him the rest of the year, saw him eight times, uh, saw him a couple times with a gun, never could get on him. One night, I had him at 350 yards with a gun, but he was just over the fence line, so I, or, you know, property line, I could not shoot him. And then uh, December 18th, he got hit by a car and died in the ditch of the farm. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. So, mm. and then just more salt to the wound. I got a salvage tag and everything to go get him after work. And um, right before I got there, within an hour before I got there, somebody had cut his antlers off. Jeez. So, yeah. But I guess that story is kind of like, you know, it's kind of a the I, I don't know he, he's he has the story of of he was a four-year-old that showed up so much he was on every camera in daylight all year and he lived in the one acre i have a hundred pictures of him in that one acre in the daylight chasing does through that hub really? betting there Yo, oh, yeah i mean he lived in it lived in one acre and that was his little domain um and then That's when cool. i shot when I shot him, another buck had come in, a three-and-a-half-year-old that I had another opportunity at, too, um, in that same stand that I shot him out of, uh, and I wasn't able to get a shot off. But after I shot Jim, and he kind of moved out. That deer moved in, and he and he took it over. And, you know, kind of to go back to the point where I said a little bit ago about, you know, everything I read, you know, you had to have a canopy over these deer and over these bucks. This happened by happenstance. It was by accident. I had this camera on this hub. Like I said, I wanted to get every, you know, just see what the movement was. 
and what I was finding is that all these bucks were betting in this little 10 by 10 area with no canopy over them. They would bed there all day. I had a buck sit there and bed there for seven hours one day in the daylight all day. He was there and I have every picture of it. Like he came in from the North and it was, it was crazy how it happened because he came in with the wind to his nose and he bedded down with the wind to his back. So he came in from the North and when he bedded down, he watched his trail coming in, you know, for any, any danger or anything. And he had the wind to his back. So he could smell everything behind him. Um, and then about four hours in, he got up and kind of stretched and resituated and turned around and bedded back down facing South. And I, it, a trigger kind of went off in my head and I'm like, why did, you know, why did he do that? So I went to Weather Underground. I don't know if you guys know the website Weather Underground. Yep. Um, oh, yeah. So I went on to Weather Underground because it's like one of the only websites that you can go back and look at the day and see what the weather, sure. everything was. I went to that day, and I'm not kidding. It was within 10 minutes of him getting up and, and kind of resituating himself. The wind had switched from north all the way to the south. Or no, I'm sorry. It would have been the opposite. So the wind was coming south and north so it, it, it switched from the south and it was it was coming out of the north so he situated right. himself for the wind to be to his back so he could smell behind him still and look for anything coming downwind it was unbelievable and how far did he move aaron from one spot to the other he just stood up and stretched it and put and sat right back in his home in the same bed okay okay nice yeah he didn't move far at all he just got up like you said did some and i have a succession of pictures for seven hours of this deer doing that oh wow and, wow yeah it's it's crazy and so you you kind of found that out by accident huh i mean like everybody yeah. talks about the canopy like you said and there's a ton of guys i know um who don't like the canopy and will never put a canopy over a deer's head or trying yeah. to create a canopy which is cool too i mean yeah. you're really different strokes for different folks and you know different tools in your arsenal um i've seen it work i've seen it work without the canopy so it's interesting how you kind of did that by accident and uh that's where they that's where they like to bed yeah and you know coming into this year i just had checked that same camera i never moved that camera um i actually put it on video mode and you know i just checked it last weekend i went back and checked the frost seating which is coming up unbelievable and uh I've got six bucks that are living in there right now all together and all of them will bed down in that little opening right now no as way. a bachelor group. Yeah. It's, I'm, it's, it's opened up my eyes to, you know, going back to like the habitat and hinge cutting and, and how to do it. And like you said, different strokes for different folks and everything. But I have found in my scenario is that yeah. like these deer, they want, I don't, I just feel like if you go a little bigger than 10 by 10, it might be too big for them. I think it's just perfect size to where they feel secure, but there's enough trail systems to get out and where they can see. And, you know, I, I just think they just feel really secure in there. And, you know, there's nothing above them. They, you know, they get sunlight, they get shade. I put food there. There's water. They literally can stand up and walk 10 yards and get a drink of water and come back and lay back down, you know, and, Honestly, it's it kind of hurt me in a way though because now it's it's hard to hunt it. I need to figure out how to hunt it because the deer just want to be in there so much, you know. Now is that? Oh, this... Aaron, do you have? Uh, oh, go ahead, do you have cameras out all year? I do. I do run cameras all year, and everybody calls me crazy. But uh, do you find do you find that the deer, uh, the population is is pretty stable year round, or do you see shifts with um, more deer at certain times of the year than others? So on the one acre, when it hits, um, I'm going to say January 1. When January 1 comes, I won't get a picture of a deer until um, March or April. They're just gone. They just, they, there's, north of me, there's a big section of timber that's like all wooded. And I think there's more opportunity for them there for more food because in my area it's lacking food you know the farmers get the crops right. off and there's there's nothing it's barren and i think they just leave so 
within those two to three months, I, I don't see deer at all. Um, but then now, you know, getting into turkey season in, in April and stuff like that, the deer come back full force and, you know, and, and on my 80, my one acre there, I can't tell you that I'm holding deer, but deer love to be there. Um, sure. You know, I'm getting, you know, a couple thousand pictures every month, you know, that I, you know, wow. don't have the camera out. So, and it's, like I said, it's only on that little, I put that resurrection clover in there and, you know, for a frost seeding and, and they are loving it and they love to bet in it. They love to eat it. They love just to play in it. And it's, I love watching it. <laughs> no, that's interesting. I was telling not- Brian and uh, our buddy Al, I was out at my place on Monday morning and I had beds in my clover as well. Uh, two or three of them must've been a little doe family or something, but um, it was already like, 12 inch high clover too it's really yeah it's, you know it's like end of may yeah it's it's been a yeah. uh it's been a established plot from last year but um so it's got a good start and i did frost it again like you did as well aaron but it's uh they, they do like that clover yeah it's for sure and that clover blend that um that nick i don't know nick personally i think you guys kind of work with him yeah um, yep. i got that clover blend yeah. resurrection man that stuff is good stuff it is unbelievable and like i said i don't have a horse in the race you know i, I bought his bag of clover one year and i'm like i'm gonna throw this out and see what happens and man i'm impressed with it yeah he puts a lot of time in uh research into his stuff before it comes to market I, it, it's really fascinating that if you ever get a chance to run into him at a show or uh talk to him over the phone it's his mindset, it's just, he's so passionate about it and he won't put anything out there that he hasn't tested and um, made it a hundred percent before it gets to that point. Yeah, for sure. Yep. But you know, I, just, I just had another follow up on uh, uh, the, the differences you might see between corn and beans with, with this one acre. Is there, is there any, we talked about the uh, shift with the time of year. How about with the crop rotations? You do you notice any differences in the movement or the deer numbers when it's corn versus beans? So, the year that it was corn was the first year that we had the farm, and it was literally I threw up one stand and you know put up a camera and just wanted to kind of know what was there. And we honestly didn't hunt it. My wife and I didn't hunt it a lot that year. She bow hunted it more. She passed up a, a buck that she probably should have took with her bow. Um, but she just wanted something a little bigger and you know, that's what she's, it's a goal of hers. And, but, uh, that year with corn, you know, I had a lot of bucks that would be around that noon time frame in the rut that would be just cruising on the edge of the corn in between the corn and the timber. Like I said, I never saw a deer in the timber on there. Um, that first year. Now I was worried when it went from corn to beans two years in a row. And I'm like, Oh, how, how's this, how's this going to work? You know, this is like, right. there's no, there's no cover anymore, you know? And honestly, last year I was so surprised. I hunted like four days in a row and saw a three and a half year old buck or bigger in the daylight hours, four days in a row. And some of, you know, I can see so far, so, you know, a couple were too far away, but I was still, you know, patrolling their, their movements and what they were doing, you know, and, it's crazy to me how, you know, it's, I think us as hunters and we look at like these open fields and it's like, there would never be a deer out there, but I'm telling you, like, we're not at the farm all the time, like to see everything and what goes on. It's amazing to me how deer just walk across a wide open field. I mean, a field you're talking about, you could see your dog run away for two days. You stand on a beer can, you can see him run away for three, you know? And it's like, it, it, they just walk, it's flat up, up there. you know. All right. Yeah, and it's it's crazy, and you know that it kind of when it comes gun season, that kind of ends, you know, because most of those deer get shot. But uh, you know, it it just makes you scratch your head, like, what the hell is he doing out there? Like, why is he out there? And then that makes you think, like, okay, well, he's doing that in that area for some reason. And I had that happen to me, you know. Like I said, there were some topography changes in this field, 
Well, there is a section of timber that they, the deer literally have a runway across the road and the, the topography change, I mean, is nothing. It's hardly any, I mean, if you were to ride a dirt bike down this thing, you probably couldn't even make a jump out of it, but it's a little divot mm. in the field that they just like to be in the little divot. You know, they think they're out of the way of everything, but they mm. use it all the time. And it's like those little things just don't overlook them. And, you know, I'm starting to think too, I was always thought like you can't kill, uh, you know, three and a half, four and a half year old deer on a field edge in Michigan. I'm here to tell you if you got the right situation and you do the right things, play the win and you have good access, you can do it. You can do it. And it, you know, just, just be smart about it. Sure. Now tell me about your scent control. This this type of a setup, you have to get in and out. Are you big on it? Do you not so much care? You just play the wind, or what's your approach? I'm okay. <laughs> I'm pretty big on it. Um, playing the wind, one hundred percent. If it, I don't really push it much, um, if it's like a iffy wind, it depends on how hard the wind's blowing, or, or you know. But I'm playing the wind all the time. But scent control is. Um, you know, a tub that I've, I've got like three tubs, scent lock tubs that they make, you know, those green and gray, you know, gray lids. I use those. Um, I am a freak when it comes to dirt wafers. I love dirt wafers. <laughs> um, you can call me old school. You can I call me it. weird. It but good. I know, man. I like wafers. that earth scent. <laughs> yeah, it smells <laughs> good. For sure. <laughs> my wife, it's like my scent all year. It's like I put it on me like cologne, you know. I love that smell. Um, but I, I put it those in my bow case i put them in my quivers on my arrows like i put wafers in my truck everywhere <laughs> um i wash my nice. clothes i wash my clothes you know with scent free soap and i don't spray down though um i just i don't i don't know i'm not sold on on scent free spray i i have in the past a lot but i just I don't know. There's nothing that really like out there proves to me that it's, it's, you know, it works that good. I don't know. I use an Ozonics. Sure. I'm a firm believer in Ozonics. Yep. I really am. Um, I never was until my buddy basically put it in my pack one night and told me to use his. And he's like, literally just try this. And I was in Missouri and uh, I hunted with it for eight days and I had mature does, mature bucks downwind, and never got blown at one time. And I went and got one myself. And I don't go in the stand without Rosonics. I'm a firm believer in them. And you know, a lot of times, you know, people say they're gimmicky. They, you know, I thought the same thing. But, you know, it's expensive. They're expensive to try, you know, try them. But I don't know. I'm just a firm believer in them. Um, and then uh, I have. So what Aaron's trying to say is there's any Rosonics guys out there listening up would be to try them out and a lot of feedback for you go ahead <laughs> and i don't have a horse in that race either i'm not sponsored by ozonics or nothing it's just something i believe in and i use um Scentlock's coming out with a oz machine that's kind of like an ozonics they, they really actually have a new bag system that i really like that i started using last year um it's where this unit goes in the bag and it's got perforated tubes that go throughout the bag and you plug it in, and it's an it's a O2 generator or Oz generator that puts that basically that ozone in your and breaks down the um, the the stuff in your clothes, and and that's kind of the extent of my of my scent control. I always wear knee high boots, rubber boots. I always tuck my boots in. I hate doing it, but I always do it. Um, and there's a couple things that go against me. I hate wearing gloves. Um, if I wear gloves, they're fingerless gloves. It doesn't matter how cold they are or cold it is. I just do not like wearing gloves. I, I don't know. It's just a thing I have. I don't wear gloves. <laughs> and um, I always wear a neck gaiter. I feel like a neck gaiter is pivotal to have. Um, and I always, you know, pull it up over my nose because a lot of that scent comes out of your mouth. And uh, I wear a lot of ball caps, like trucker caps. And I started trying to get away from that a little bit last year and wearing a beanie that I also wash and scent free soap and do all that stuff to it. Um, just to kind of keep that bad smell in my hair, just kind of keep that trapped in. But that's, that's about it. Um, I don't like wiping down my bow with anything because everything rusts on it and I don't really 
want a rusty boat because you pay so much money for them all the time. Um, oh, but man, I, it and, sounds like our buddy Brent's Hoyt all the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Let, let me tell you about Brent. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's going to love that. Uh, I know all about Brent. Yeah, I oh, actually yeah. talked to him today because he wants me to use your band for the Total Archer Challenge. So, <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, that's why he called me earlier. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. But uh, oh, you're more than welcome. Yeah. I already paid for it, so <laughs> that's what he said. He's like, I'm gonna steal. He said when you couldn't come up there and shoot, he's like, I'm gonna steal your band and give it to somebody else. So, but I feel like I'm second fiddle because he already asked all of his friends. So and then he's doing. Uh, he's he's calling me and wanting me to come up. So. Oh, what a Thanks turd! A lot, buddy, if you're listening to this, <laughs> what a turd, Brent. Yeah, we're gonna make sure you listen to this one. Yeah. Well, Aaron, I think, I think, what we, I mean, what we've gone over, we've basically gone through where you started in terms of hunting and habitat management, and where you're at now, and whether it's just the hinging and the all the habitat work that you've done, opening up the canopy in your one acre to, I mean, I noticed you pay a lot of attention to scouting, scouting cameras. I mean, yep. more so than a lot of people do. That, I would say, is equally as important to everything we've talked about. Um, oh, yeah. Even the wind and the access. I mean, we we beat on access on this podcast just because Huge. Small properties, you have to. Uh, oh, you have to do it right, or you blow the property out and you're done. And a small property doesn't recycle as fast as you know something bigger where you can spread out. So, all those things. I mean, your scent control as well. I mean, I think it's just a really good episode. You know, kind of just like a like you said, like a BS session about how you do it, where you're at, and what works for you. And I uh, really enjoyed it. Yeah. I I did well too. I'm sorry I probably talked most of the time. <laughs> Wouldn't let you guys get a word in edgewise. No, that's I great. On a tangent there, but no, you're good. Um, that's what uh that's why you have a podcast, and that's why you know, <laughs> as a good host does, he sits back and listens to his guests. So I know yeah, I I want to make sure that we cover everything you want to cover though. Um, is there anything else that we haven't covered so far that you think we might have missed? Um, I mean we could we could go on for hours, like breaking down, like you guys, you guys know, I mean, we could break down different types of hinges and, you know, and, and what to do and what trees to hinge and what not to hinge. I mean, we could do that at a later time, but um, I think the biggest thing that I kind of, from my experience that I want to let everybody know, and just to think about a little more, and I'm not saying, like I said, I'm not saying I'm a expert at this by any means. This is just going off of what I have learned and, and my experiences. And, you know, when you're hunting small acres like this, like you guys just said, access is number one. But I think in a lot of times, I think we give deer a lot, or I think we give deer too much credit in a lot of ways. Like when I went in there to hunt Jim Abbott, you know, it, it's like a rule out there. I don't know whoever wrote it that said, you know, deer feed in fields at all night, which they do. I'm not saying they don't. But, you know, a lot of people say you can't get into a stand through a field if you have the right scenario like that's one of those things that i feel like you got to push the envelope sometimes and go for broke and that's kind of what i did in a way in in getting in there i just didn't execute the shot you know i did kick a deer out but luckily for me it wasn't the deer that i was after and i would just kind of take a step back and be a little more patient and kind of as you break everything down, break it down one more step into kind of the granular form. And when you see a deer do something, ask why. Why did that do that? Why? They're doing it for some reason, you know. Um, and, you know, just think outside the box every once in a while. And if you have to go through a field in the morning, get in there really, really early. I mean, I, I was sitting in my stand just breathing, waiting for daylight for like an hour and a half. You know, it's, it's something you don't want to do, but it paid off, you know? Well, in some sense it did. I had my opportunity. I just didn't capitalize. Hey, so, that was a sure. successful hunt, man. No matter which way you look at it, you yeah, got the deer, so, you got the opportunity. So, yeah, I guess that would be just my biggest thing. And, and, uh, 
you know, and this year I'm, I'm going to, which I might ask you guys a little bit more about um, is I've got border patrol for, you know, for a food plot and along for access and everything. And that's something I've never planted it. I, and the reason why is I'm too afraid to plant it because everybody doesn't have good luck with it. And it's like, don't do that, you know? So I need to know a little more about that and, you know, trying to plant some border patrol and I need to get it in the ground quick here. Probably I'm starting to think. Yeah, I know. It's funny uh, you mentioned that because uh, I just got some planted and did a lot of filming, and I'll be sharing that here on our YouTube channel here in the next week or two. Yeah, I can't wait to see that because I need to. I need some work on my on my green thumb. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you uh, you keep listening to us, you might learn one thing or two. It might not be the right thing, but you'll learn something. And uh, I know that I've planned that killer food plots border patrol in the past. Um, I think Nick said you want to have it in by, he told me first of June before, but I think you can push that a little bit. I'm going to have to push that because I'm still in a swamp in my food plots. So, um, but that, I mean, you could even, you could make what they call the, the border patrol hallway to your one acre. You could make a, 10 or 15 foot wide strip from your access point to your one acre. And when it's, you know, four or five, six foot tall, or even before that, you could mow a path or spray a path right down the middle of it for you to walk through. It only has to be right. shoulder width. Um, the deer will find that probably too tight and too compact to, to walk through. They probably won't even walk down it. So that could get you across that field um, whenever you want, really. And don't forget about smoke screen. That smoke screen supposedly does a little bit better in uh, less desirable soils. That's another product that he come out with. That if you're if you've got the pH is a little bit lower or if it's a little wetter area, that uh, smoke screen might be a better choice for you. Yep. Okay, I, I've got that on my family farm. Is I got some low pH, um, and it's pretty sandy, and it's in between two. My plot, I've done it for the last, you know, eight or ten years. My plot is in between two pine grove thickets, basically. And, you know, those pines rip a lot of nutrients out of the ground, um, from my sure. experience. And I can get I can get buckwheat or buck forage oats and stuff to grow in there, but you know, I'm probably not doing everything I should be doing, but that's another one of those instances where it's a perfect little hidey hole food plot, but I need some border patrol for some more access. And that's just, I mean, that's yep. what you lack the most in, in more scenarios than not is access. I, I, yep. I can't beat it to death any more than that. It's just, sure. it's hard. It's hard to find perfect entry and exit. And your exits, this is important as your, you know, your entry, you know, so, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. And I know I use that, Border Patrol on my place for access. That's why I plan it. Um, I'm able to walk from where I park down past my my main food plot area to more of a transition area I like to hunt when it gets into November. And that stuff, you know, 10, 12 foot tall at least. Um, you can hit it with nitrogen when it's growing and that'll really help it boost. Um, so it's really... A few ways to it, like you said, access and cover are usually the ways you get busted. Um, so if you can, I'm taking also some border patrol and I'm running it through my food plots this year to where they won't be just wide open. There's going to be they're going to be broken up into two, and they're going to have random spots of cover all over the place. So it's going to be more of a maze and pocket effect. Oh yeah. Where, yeah, that'll help me also get by here and there, but it's going to help them feel more secure and. Make those bucks run around more, sniff around more, looking for other does in there versus just peeking out, looking across the food plot, and, and maybe moving on. So, you know, there's a couple different yeah. uses for that stuff, and uh, it's it's a good product though. He's got some good, great quality seed. Yeah, for sure, and I, I'm I've been impressed with it. So, I'm gonna probably get some more more stuff and try you know try it out a little bit more. I like your idea with putting it through the food plot, and that's you're kind of doing the same thing that I did with the one acre and you're, you're just making it so the deer have to stop a little bit and take their time through it. Right. And, and, you know, figure it out. And, you know, instead of just going on the downwind side and just sent, check it and being gone without going through it. I mean, that's, that's another point. Just make them, 
make them have to go through that stuff to give you an opportunity. And, you know, you can create funnels, which you guys know, you know, you can create funnels in a lot of different ways, either with hinge cutting or border patrol or, you know, different ways to go by your stand. And that's, what's so intriguing to me. And, you know, I had three sand, stand sites in the one acre and I made funnels by each stand, but you know, I wasn't able to hunt it much. And, you know, that's, that's just the cards you dealt sometimes. And this year I'm taking a step back and I'm actually, I've got one stand in the one acre now where I'm going to leave it. I got one on one point and then I'm actually going to utilize a box blind um, on the edge on an inside corner where my access, I can, I can get behind, you know, this box blind down the wood lot or wood line and I can enter it and I can get into this box blind and still be able to shoot a bow out of, and I can be within 80 yards of, you know, where these bucks are going to be betting. And I just got to hope they got to, you know, come by me. So that's going to be my biggest, biggest change this year is, is kind of using that box blind a little bit for one cent to access and not like, it's almost like an observation stand, but you know, there's no trees right there. So I got to do with what I can do and just kind of, I'm still there, but maybe I can get them to kind of come out in the inside corner of the, of the ag field and, you know, get an opportunity that way. There you go. Right. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask you was what were you, or what do you have on your list for, for new projects for the one acre this year? Anything else besides that? So, yeah. So, what I did was Cole and I went in there this winter and on the, it would be the West edge of the one acre timber. There's a lot of like crab apple trees, okay. which hinge pretty well. Um, but they're just bushy trees that like really don't do a lot. And the canopy is up a little higher. So we went through there and, and hinged a lot of them and just to thicken up the edge. So I could, you know, walk in, you know, it was Perfect. all, it was all just, for access and just thicken it up even more because I don't really want to tamper with a lot inside now because I've got my structure there and the deer really liked it last year. So I want to see if it happens again this year and then kind of go from there. But honestly, I don't have a lot of more trees to hinge. I mean, there's a few in there. Um, actually there's quite a few, but I don't, I want to leave some trees in there too. Um, that was the biggest thing. And then on that inside corner, I needed a I needed a reason for those deer to come out in that inside corner by the box line. Um, so what we did is we created a funnel um, off off of one of the main trail systems. We created a funnel that may had we're making them have to go to that that uh, that inside corner. And yep. So that that was the biggest changes. Um, and like I said, that frost seeding. That's a game changer right now. Uh, it's unbelievable how that's coming up. And I planted the trail systems as well. That came up okay, but the deer are just walking the trail so much that it's just like getting trampled. Um, I mean, it's all the trails are down to mud. And nice. So that's that's they're exciting. Using it. Uh, that's yeah, awesome. yeah, they're using it. They like it a lot. And uh, yeah, so that's the that's the biggest thing. I mean, and then just keep my butt out of there. <laughs> so. Yeah, a lot of good information, Aaron. I appreciate you sharing it with us. Uh, one thing that really st uh, struck me early on in our conversation, and I hope our listeners picked up on it, I love how you keep your goals realistic. I mean, a guy like you working with the Kiefer brothers and going to all these places and filming these big bucks, it, it could be really easy to get starstruck and uh, – buck fever and think to yourself, well, I'm not shooting anything but 140s, 150s, et cetera. But I, I just love how you come out and said, you know, we got some Pope and young bucks and 125 inch buck with a bow is, is an accomplishment. And that's what gets lost on a lot of people sometimes today. And just, just the fact that you celebrate that and you keep the goals realistic, I can't emphasize that enough. I just, I just hope a lot more people start to see that and just appreciate what they have in their area and be proud of it. Yeah. And you know, that was kind of something that, uh, I, you know, growing up in Michigan and having that tradition, you know, is, is something to be said because if you, if you've never been, and I'm sure it is like out in PA and everything and there, there's traditions everywhere, but you know, I only know what I grew up in and, 
you know, I, I got to be realistic with myself and, you know, I'm not going to sit there and hold out for a 140, 150 when I've never seen one in Michigan, really. You know, I've <laughs> yeah. never had one on yep. camera. You know, my unicorns are 125 to 130 inch three and a half year olds. And I'm, I'm telling you what, the day that I lose the adrenaline rush over that is the day that I probably will stop hunting Michigan. But I don't ever foresee that happening because there's just something about seeing a three and a half year old to four and a half year old deer to get them to be able to, you know, cruise in daylight hours, regardless of the score. You know, like, I think a lot of people get wrapped up in score. I, I do as well. It's easy to do that. That's the way our sure. our world is now. And, but um, the story and, and the, the journey is what's so cool to me. And, you know, shooting Jim Abbott last year, even though I wasn't able to recover him and, and, and you know, and, and do it in an ethical way and kill him, even though I didn't, I was so upset, but I remember going home and telling my wife, I'm like, you know, after uh, the last couple of days of, of looking for him and, and not finding him and finding out he's still alive, I, you know, kind of had to, she had to ground me a little bit and say, you know what, you've spent so much time putting in an off season to just get one opportunity at a deer that you've been chasing for three years now. And it's like, you had that opportunity. Yeah. yeah. It didn't come out to, you didn't, yeah, it did, you didn't, the outcome wasn't the greatest, but you know, you hung that stand, you did all the pre-work, everything, you know, the hinge cutting, habitat, all that stuff. And you got them within range on three acres. She's like, you, you accomplished your goal. And it kind of like resonated with me a little bit. And it's like, yeah, like, why am I being so ungrateful and being, you know, pissing and moaning when it's like, I'm hunting. This is what I do. Even though I didn't, you know, complete my goal the way I wanted to, I did complete my goal. I was successful, you know, and that's what's, that's what's fun to me, you know, and like I said, those bucks are unicorns for me around here and you don't see them every day. At least I don't. And that's still what's really cool to me. And that's what I like. So. Well, what I thought was really cool about this whole conversation and listening to your stuff and is that you've, you know, you've done all this through hunting and habitat work, focus and just sweat stuff that all of our listeners and all of your listeners can go out and do themselves. Everybody can do this stuff. Getting this unicorn three and a half year old, 125 inch deer, which is the same goal that I have for my property, by the way, is something we can all do by just creating better habitat, hunting smarter, understanding deer biology better, just just doing the stuff that we talk about and and learning. So I just like to literally your this podcast is like a story of how just anybody can go out and do it even on a one acre piece of woods. That's just so cool. Yeah, for sure, man. And you know, it's if anybody out there is listening to this and, and has any further questions for either, you know, Jared or, you know, you guys or Brian and me, I mean, feel free. I'm an open book. I have no secrets, whatever you want. I mean, get a hold of me, get a hold of you guys. I'm yep. sure the same thing. Like, oh, yeah. I, I love talking about this stuff and any way I can help someone else is, is huge. And lastly, I know I'm kind of dragging on here. There's one oh, thing good. that I do want to, there's one thing that I've, I've been doing the last couple of years that I, that's really helped me out. And it's just the way my brain works is I take a journal. Oh, I got to start um, doing this. <laughs> it's, I take a journal of everything <laughs> I do. I had, I started in 2012 and I literally would write down, you know, I keep it in my truck in the center council. When I get back to the truck in a night hunt or morning hunt, I would write down what I see. I saw two fawns, you know, two button bucks or whatever. I saw three year and a half old deer. And then I'd tally up like at the end of the year, what I saw, you know, the age class of bucks that I saw and how many deer I saw. And it was really cool to see that at the end of the year, but I also kind of took it a step further two years ago. I took a journal for every time I stepped on the property, whatever I did, I wrote a date. I wrote what happened. Um, I went and hinge cut it, uh, you know, the one acre, I, I frosty, whatever I did. I had two does walk up on me while I was doing it. 
it, it's just because I'm kind of anal about it, that kind of stuff. But uh, it was it was cool to see the progression of that. And for one thing, I wanted something that my kids, you know, later, hopefully, if they have the same passion as I did, they could, you know, listen to my podcast or my, or my grandkids, you know, later in life, they could be like, this is how grandpa was or, you know, and they could read this journal and be like, this is grandpa's life in the fall, you know, or something. That was kind of my first inclination, but then it kind of started coming into something more about like the barometric pressure was 30.25 and it was out of the Southwest and the wind was, it was overcast and I put all that in my head and, and then I go back and, and look and see what worked. And I don't know if it helps, but it helps me just kind of stay focused, I guess you could say. And it's kind of fun to do. Um, and at the end of this year, I ended up, I, I'd have to go back and look, but the one acre, I only, I, I don't count um, like yearling deer. I only count adult deer and I saw 17 bucks and 17 does. Now, yeah, there were probably some different, you know, the same deer a couple times in there, but throughout the year, you know, cause the one acre, I don't see a lot of deer. The herd's not like the biggest herd out there, but at the end of the year, I saw like the, you know, my buck to doe ratio I figured was around, you know, one to one, which is wow. pretty good. You know, um, I don't know. Sure. Where, I don't know how, how accurate that is, but that's just from my notes of, and what I took. So, um, but yeah, I would say that's like a cool way to uh, be able to, you know, just jot things down. Cause I'll tell you, even in my day to day life, if I don't write it down, I forget it. <laughs> so <laughs> my wife would say the same thing. <laughs> Wait till you, know, you hit your forties. <laughs> I don't want to think about that yet. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's but awesome. That's, Aaron. that's what I got, man. Well, if anybody wants to find more about Aaron Blysey, where can they go? Uh, well, the first thing, I guess, would be obviously Instagram. I have my own personal Instagram. I don't do a lot of it on it. You're probably going to see a lot of my kid and my wife and a little bit of hunting. But then um, go to the Fall Podcast Instagram, and that's where I post a lot of my stuff of what I'm doing hunting-wise and I kind of keep family stuff off of that. That's just for, you know, hunting and hunting related things. Go to there. Um, iTunes, go search the fall podcast. You can, you know, download, subscribe there. I've got all my podcast episodes on my YouTube channel, the fall podcast. I'm starting to put up more videos, more like vlog style videos up there. So a lot of my listeners have been wanting to see more videos of, you know, bow tuning and, and, you know, what I'm doing with hinge cutting and, I just whip my cell phone out and just take a video and put it up. It's raw. It's real. It's real time. So, you know, there's another good spot. And then anything that I do day to day with Chris and Casey, um, Sportsman's Channel, Rival Wild is our whitetail show. It's on right now, Wednesday nights at 730. Um, and then Dropped is another show. It's not airing right now. Um, and then the Kiefer Brothers YouTube channel, basically everything on there. I either had a hand in editing, filming, or I'm the talent in it. So I'm getting worked into Very more cool. like in front of the camera as well. So that's just another way to, way to find it as well. So, yeah, that's that's me. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, I want to thank you one more time for coming on the Habitat Podcast. I uh, really enjoyed talking to you. I think you are so much like Brian and I. It's ridiculous. So it was uh, just a matter Absolutely. of time before we got together. Yeah, for sure, man. Thanks for having me on, and, and I need to return the favor here, so maybe in the next couple of weeks I can have both you guys on here, and, and we can maybe get down to the nitty-gritty of some, uh, you know, any other sort of habitat stuff, and a lot of my listeners want to hear more of that, and like I said, I need to, I need to work with my green thumb, and uh, you guys might be the guys I need to have on to teach me some more food plot stuff, so. We'll be there, man. Sounds good. Awesome, boys. Well, thank you very much for, for letting me come on here and, and jab your jaw for an hour and a half. And, and I always enjoy uh, talking talking deer and deer hunting. And I appreciate it. Wow, guys. Another great episode in the books. Thank you, Aaron, for coming on the show. Really great talking to you, man. I really enjoyed hearing the story of what you've done, how you started through to where you are now. And I think we have a lot in common. Uh, wish you luck this fall. And thank you for coming on the show. 
I'd like to thank the listeners once again for tuning in. Can't do it without you guys. We are continuing to get some great iTunes reviews. I'm sending out decals. Just had 100 more of them made. So be sure to get on iTunes. Leave us a good review. And I'll find you and send you a free decal. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors. We have Killer Food Plots. So be sure to share this episode on your Facebook or Instagram. And tag three friends. And you'll be entered to win a bag of climatized food plot seed. I'd like to thank Packer Max Cult to Packers. The Habitat Hook from Nation's Creations, Dip That Hydrographics, and Michigan Whitetail Pursuit. If you guys want to see some turkey hunting and some old deer hunts, go on MichiganWhitetailPursuit.com and check them out. Guys, for any of you who have not listened to us before, our podcasts are available on HabitatPodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, iHeartRadio, wherever you can find a podcast, we should be on there. An easy place to get them all is just HabitatPodcast.com. Uh, we post each one up there for you, and then you can download it or uh, or subscribe on there to our email sent out, and we'll let you know when we launch a new one as well. So thank you once again to everybody who came out to the show and listened today. I appreciate it, and we will talk to you guys again soon. And uh, look forward for another episode as we become better habitat managers. Bye.